What is our chance for survival if an enemy attacks? One of our primary defensive actions against an air attack may be a salvo of rockets or missiles fired by a Navy pilot flying in a supersonic fighter, or by surface craft equipped with guided missiles, both hundreds of miles from our territorial shores. This will be one phase of an integrated defense system, including United States Navy forces at sea and Army and Air Force units of our continental air defense system. If our airborne weapons systems are fully capable of doing the job expected of them, enemy aircraft will find it difficult to evade, outspeed, or outmaneuver them. How big is this if? How effective is our defense? Are the men operating our defense systems training under the most accurately simulated tactical situations possible? Radar operators, fighter pilots, guided missile and gunnery crews cannot be trained for split-second counterattack with slow sitting duck targets. Realistic training and evaluation of defense systems must be accomplished using targets which not only simulate actual enemy aircraft performance, but require efficient utilization of time. As time is an all-important combat factor. The KDA-4 Fire B target developed by the Ryan Aeronautical Company for the United States Navy is tangible evidence of the new trend in supporting systems for training and evaluation. Jet-to-jet, air-to-air, near-supersonic combat simulation is a daily game played in deadly earnest by United States Navy interceptor crews in the skies over zoned ocean areas. The quarry, the elusive, highly maneuverable Fire Bee KDA-4, the jet target aircraft of United States Navy drone squadrons. The hunters, Navy pilots, who, by training against a target that can realistically stimulate enemy aggression from the air, are sharpening their skills for the kill in answer to any challenge to our national safety. This jet target flies at the high speeds and altitudes of modern combat planes. It is the first target system that provides performance comparable with current first-line operational aircraft. The KDA-4 target is a high subsonic, high-altitude aerial target. Unlike converted service aircraft, it requires no special runway facilities for operation. It is air-launched in a designated area, remotely controlled and retrievable from land and sea ranges for reuse. Designed primarily as a target capable of simulating near-sonic enemy aircraft, the versatile KDA-4 is used for evaluation of weapons systems and for surface and air crew training. It has potential tactical applications as a vehicle for missile electronic countermeasure and reconnaissance assignments with minimum modification of the basic design to accommodate specialized equipment. Special devices for use on the KDA-4 to augment certain characteristics are available in kit form for field installations. These include wingtip pods containing radar corner reflectors, which are used to augment the radar return when the fire bee is used as a target for missiles which employ seeking radar. A tail cone reflector, which doubles as a drag chute container, provides additional radar reflectivity for missiles fired on a tail chase attack. Advanced auxiliary devices are being developed, including scoring devices, visual identification systems, and passive and active radar augmentation systems, which will result in the KDA-4 being even more useful in training personnel and evaluating weapons systems. Four air transportable Fire Bee shipping crates with a total weight of only 2,800 pounds are designed to facilitate handling by any common carrier. The KDA-4 components can be uncrated and assembled into operational form ready for initial flight in approximately 50 man hours. Maximum standardization of parts, simplicity of design, and ready accessibility to all compartments permit assembly line methods of maintenance and interchangeability of components as required. Maximum use has been made of non-critical materials in construction. 
The fuselage, ailerons, elevators, and rudder are of conventional semi-monocoque construction with magnesium skins and aluminum alloy structural members. The 45-degree swept-back wing is of full cantilever construction with heavy-gauge aluminum alloy skin and spars and with magnesium leading and trailing edges. The empennage is of the same type of construction, except that the skin of the vertical fin is of magnesium. A two-section aluminum alloy and plastic tail cone houses the drag and main parachute recovery systems. Empty weight of the KBA-4 is approximately 1,250 pounds. Gross weight, approximately 1,900 pounds. The compact fire bee has a wingspan of only 11 feet 2 inches, a length of 17 feet 6 inches, and is 6 feet 3 inches high. Fuel capacity is 101 gallons of JP4. Oil, 1 pint, self-contained in the engine. Preparation of the KBA-4 airframe for initial use consists of a visual inspection for possible chipping or handling damage. Then control system check is made for free and unobstructed operation and alignment of the ailerons and elevators. And proper installation of control linkages. The pedostatic system and surrounding areas are inspected for cleanliness and the system checked for leaks. The Fairchild J44 engine and accessory installations are gauged and the engine is moved to the test area. With the engine secured in the run-up stand, the power plant is manually tested and is now ready for a ground run-up. The direct control box is connected by the external power umbilical cord assembly and the engine checkout begins. Following starting procedure and initial engine operation, RPM is increased to 100% by beeping the throttle switch and decreased by reverse beeping of the throttle switch. The engine run is completed as fuel, power, and stop switches are closed. The two-stage parachute recovery system, which is stowed in the tail cone, consists of a six-foot drag chute and a 70-foot main chute. A swivel release mechanism separates the main chute from the fire bee upon surface impact. This helps prevent damage caused by surface winds dragging the target and prevents the main parachute from acting as a sea anchor in the case of water recovery. Qualified military technicians find the KDA electronic and autopilot system similar to, but not as complicated as those installed in service aircraft. Internally, there are the power plant, electrical distribution, stabilization, command control, radar tracking beacon, and parachute recovery systems. Externally, engine starting, pre-launch test, and launching circuitry expedite pre-flight testing, but add nothing to the in-flight weight of the target. Prior to flight, the completely assembled fire bee supported in the airframe stand is moved to the engine test area for final check. Then to the waiting launch plane. Hoisted to the bomb rack and the sway braces adjusted, the fire bee circuitry is connected to the launch aircraft through an umbilical connector. Utilizing the appropriate ground support equipment, a complete run-through of operational procedure is accomplished and the target is ready for flight. The day's operations start yesterday. Before the squadron secures in the evening, flight-ready KDAs are on the line. 
The gleaming red and white fire bees are fueled, checked out, prepared for early takeoff. Shortly after sunrise, purposeful groups of men are moving to their varied tasks. Command holds a briefing session for airborne, ground control, and retrieval personnel. Line crewmen converge on P2V, JD1, KDA for a last minute recheck before flight time. Word is passed to the flight line. Pilots and air crewmen man their planes. Telephone calls coordinate tower, range safety, ground control, radar, and retrieving units. Moments later, the launch plane is a receding dot in the sky, climbing to launch altitude. Track and control for today's flight will be air-to-air -air from this P2V. After takeoff, radar antenna of this airborne support aircraft begins to pulse in its search for the Fire B launch plane. Then, with steady concentration, locks on as it approaches the firing range and begins pre-launch check. Remote command control of the KDA-4 provides for climb, dive, turn, course trim, level flight at constant altitude, change of throttle settings, smoke signals, directional control while in glide phase, and parachute recovery. These commands, which are initiated by the beeper pilot through a remote control box, are relayed by an ARW-55 transmitter to an ARW-59 command control radio receiver set within the KDA. Adaptability of control illustrates another phase of KDA versatility. In flight, control of the Navy Fire Bee can be accomplished in four ways. First, from the ground. In the ground control type of operation, the KDA is launched from the JD-1. The track and control functions are accomplished from the remote ground station as intercepting aircraft are vectored into the target from ground control intercept. Second, control can be from the P2V acting as a combined launch and control plane. In P2V launch and control, two KDAs are carried aloft and checked out en route to the drop area. Track and control are accomplished from the P2V utilizing the APS-20 radar aboard the P2V and the DPN-17 beacon incorporated into the KDA. The P2V remains clear of the firing area, not to exceed a distance of 80 miles from the fire beam. Firing aircraft are vectored as necessary by the P2V or remote GCI station to close on the target. The third control method is launched from a JD-1 with control from the P2V. And fourth, in-sight control from a fighter-type aircraft which will rendezvous with this launch plane and assume control of the target just prior to launching. This in-sight control aircraft, usually an S9F, may be used either as the primary command control system or as a backup system to the other methods of control. As the ready signal is announced at the Naval Air Station, a harsh rattle of commands over a loudspeaker has triggered the organized chaos of a scramble. And in a matter of minutes, interceptor groups are scorching the atmosphere. At 
sea, carrier task force planes catapult off to join the chase. Launch countdown begins. Five, four, three, two, one, launch. And the fire bee drops away from the launch plane in a graceful curve. It loses altitude for a moment, accelerates to Mach 0.85, then climbs to mission altitude and begins its elusive game of stratospheric hide and seek with the questing fighter plane. A turn with a tactical diameter of 15,000 yards under normal conditions makes the KDA a difficult airplane to chase and an evasive adversary to kill. The KDA-4 will fly at speeds of 500 knots at 40,000 feet and has flown at altitudes in excess of 45,000 feet. It has been flown to a distance of 105 nautical miles from the ground control station and returned to be recovered in a predetermined area. It has a rate of climb of from 5,000 to 10,000 feet per minute, depending on gross weight and altitude. Individual KDAs have flown as many as 12 separate flights, with the overall average exceeding five flights before expenditure. The flotation requirement is for one hour with 50% of fuel on board. This requirement has been greatly exceeded in practice. During the next hour, the steady hand of the Fire Bee controller at the remote control center has put the target through its operational paces. A direct hit scored by an interceptor using live missile warheads frequently expends the target. However, use of inert missile warheads and utilization of parachute recovery permits reuse of the fire bee, even after successful firing runs by the interceptors. When its mission is accomplished, the drone is guided to the recovery area and parachute deployment is commanded. The recovery system is initiated on command, power failure, or loss of command control carrier. Rate of descent of the KDA-4 on the main chute is approximately 22 feet per second. Meanwhile, another unit of this Navy operational team has moved efficiently into place. As launch was signaled for the Fire Bee, a specially equipped HUS retrieval helicopter left its field and has taken station. With the parachute recovery signal, it takes a fix from the information furnished by the control station and heads toward the point of impact. Visual contact is often made while the KDA is still descending on its recovery chute or has just touched down. KDA is equipped with a modified parachute suspension bridle, which permits ready contact with a helicopter retrieval hook. As the helicopter hovers near the surface of the sea, the retrieval boom is extended. The ball and socket pivot yoke lowered to operational position, and the hook is deftly nudged into contact with the suspension bridle. This specially designed hook is so weighted that it will swing to face a point of contact. Once hook-on is made, the self-locking tongue engages. The retrieval boom disengages from the hook and is retracted into the helicopter, which hovers to a point directly over the KDA, and liftoff begins. The KDA-4 is held at low altitude to permit drainage of excess water, and then rapidly transported to the recovery airfield. KDA suspension bridle is fastened to the HUS external cargo sling by a manually and electrically controlled safety hook which permits release on command or jettison in emergency. The 
target is gently lowered to the apron. Decontamination begins. The helicopter recovery system usually permits retrieval within a few minutes of touchdown, and decontamination can frequently be initiated in an hour or less. Retrieval may also be accomplished by surface craft. Complete reconditioning after recovery involves disassembly of the target into nacelle, engine, wing, empennage, and fuselage components. All compartment doors are removed, and all electronic control, power plant, and airframe units are inspected, decontaminated, repaired, and repacked. Following reconditioning, the veteran target receives its insignia of service and is ready to return to operation, an integral part of the Navy's training for tomorrow.